About this de-dollarization action, a collective actions of so many countries have been done. What are actually the main costs of countries in the world starting to abandon the U.S. dollar currency, in your opinion? Well, there's a famous author in the United States named Mark Twain, and he once famously said, the rumors of my demise are greatly exaggerated. And I think that's certainly the case with the U.S. dollar. Uh, there is no secondary competitor to the U.S. dollar, and, and we'll talk a little bit about why. Uh, what you've seen in the first quarter of 2023 is a huge surge in conversation on Twitter, on Reddit, about 600 percent increase uh, in the term de-dollarization over Q4 of 2022. So this is all the talk. And the reason that you're seeing a lot of talk, Safrina, is because the dollar has come off of a, a really accelerated uh, level. Uh, it's fallen off about 13% since the September, October period. And people are saying, see, the dollar is getting weak. But you need to put this in perspective. The dollar runs in cycles. It peaked in 1969 and then got weak for many years. It peaked in 1985 and then got weak for many years. It peaked in 2001 and then got weak for many years, which, by the way, Precipitated a, precipitated a tremendous rally in emerging markets from 2002 to 2007, which we can talk about. Uh, and I think, uh, I think it looks like we peaked in uh, September, October of 2022, which is actually a sign of positive things to come. Because when people flock to the dollar as they did in 2022 uh, during the tightening cycle, it means that they're scared it means that they're frightened about a, a global slowdown. And when you start to see that uh, dollar weaken a little bit, it means people have started to breathe. They see a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think what we're seeing now is the Fed is ending its tightening cycle, if not at this meeting, at the next meeting. And we should see some continued weakness uh, through the end of the year for the U.S. dollar in fits and starts. And that's a very positive thing for uh, equities. Uh, outside the U.S., U.S. tech equities. Uh, and I think overall, it's going to be a very constructive thing for emerging markets. So I wouldn't count the U.S. dollar out. There's no real competitor that uh, yeah. can facilitate uh, reserves and can, can facilitate international trade in the way that the U.S. dollar has for, for many, many years. Well, nice that you point out the famous quote, rumors of my demise are greatly exaggerated. That's that's really nice. And there's no competitor to the U.S. dollar. But the rumors about the, the thing about this de-dollarization are already swirling around. Because of this, what is actually the impact felt by the United States? Any actions taken for the United States because of the swirling issue? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's not a major issue. As a matter of fact, uh, it's actually a positive for multinational companies and S&P earnings to get a little weakness in the dollar. That's been a headwind for a lot of our major companies that do a tremendous amount of their business offshore. Like some of the major tech companies, over 50% of their business comes offshore. So the dollar weakening is actually going to be constructive for our U.S. equity markets moving forward. Uh, you know, in order to have a real competitor, Safrina, what you would need is an economy that's open to the ebbs and flows of international trade and foreign investment. So when you think about uh, the potential competitor in the yuan, uh, they don't meet that characteristic. They have uh, restrictions. They have government rules. You need a liquid bond market that's open to foreign participation. You don't, you don't have that in China. You don't have anything close to it in China. Uh, you need an acceptance of an exchange rate that's accepted by the market. You don't have that with the yuan because the Chinese government sets the exchange rate. Uh, and you need confidence in the rule of law, political governance, and financial regulation. And I got to say, after the actions of the Chinese government in the last 18 months, with their zero COVID, with their tech crackdown, with shutting down the education sector, there's zero confidence in the government's ability to run a level playing field, run by a rule of law, run by rationality. So uh, the idea that the yuan could potentially be a reserve currency in the future, uh, I think the actions taken in the last 18 months have set them back uh, 5 to 10 to 20 years in terms of that po uh, possibility moving forward. Right, Thomas. Because you mentioned about yuan, actually about this uh, action of de-dollarization, do you think that this will be another of trade war, just something that happened in 20, 2016 and 2019 between China and U.S. because of they trying to leave the U.S. dollar uh, utilization or in the economy? 
Well, I don't think that's the reason for the trade war. I think the reason for the trade war uh, is that um, uh, there is a sense of uh, increasing competition globally. Uh, the U.S. is trying to protect their, their economic hegemony. China is trying to protect their economic hege mm. uh, hegemony. But the, co the codependence and the interdependence uh, is critical to the success of both countries. So while you'll see these different restrictions and, and uh, attempts to have uh, trade friction, at the end of the day, China needs the U.S. for global trade. The U.S. needs China for global trade. So uh, while you'll see some, some stipulations at the edge and some restrictions at the edge and at the margins, uh, at the end of the day, there's, there's just too much codependence. And, uh, and I think that the, the sooner they learn how to work through those differences, uh, the better it's going to be for both uh, countries and for both populations. So I think those are just uh, short-term headlines. A lot of pressure mm. around the supply chain issues that came through COVID. Yeah. Uh, and as things ease up and the supply chain e eases up, we'll see better things moving, moving ahead. Right, Thomas. But um, you mentioned that this is a short-term headline and everyone is pushing the U.S., the United States, because of the pandemics that have happened. But do you think the United States will give a response about this and what it will be? Well, I, I think the number one thing that we're going to see is certainly countries like Russia, like China, like Brazil. Brazil and China are trying to do a deal to settle trade in their own currencies. Uh, but the fact of the matter is the, the dollar is the undisputed king. OK, the mm -hmm. central bank, it represents 58.4 percent of central bank reserves. The switching costs are simply too high. There's no second tier currency that could possibly replace the U.S. dollar at this point in, in present, because there's none that meet the criteria that we laid out. Forty percent of international trade is done in the U.S. dollar. The second best currency is the euro, but the euro doesn't meet some of the characteristics that I laid out uh, in terms of bec becoming the, the number one currency. Uh, so while there will be you know, trade fighting, as there always has been for decades, uh, and different tariffs and different tit for tat, uh, I think as we move forward out of COVID, I think we're going to see a, a greasing of the skids. The second thing, you know, where are you seeing also major attempted de-dollarization with Russia? Well, that's, that's natural. We've, we've applied a lot of sanctions to them for their, you know, unilateral aggression towards uh, the Ukraine. Uh, they're naturally going to want to, to fight back in that regard, and they try to do so with a non-dollar den denominated uh, foreign trade. Uh, and uh, but at the end of the day, people want U.S. dollars. It, we have the rule of law. We have the yeah. largest military in the world, the largest economy in the world. We're still growing due to immigration. We've got a young, growing, dynamic population with the millennials, 80 right. million millennials. Uh, and, and we're the major reserve a asset. So even if economic hegemony mm. did begin to decline, which is the kind of the narrative behind de-dollarization. Historically, it takes many decades to even a century to lose that reserve status, even if the economy did start start to decline in the U.S. Right. Right, Thomas. And still about the U.S. dollar, especially its supremacy. The U.S. dollar have been increasingly questioned since the 2008 global financial crisis and even more because of the high interest rate era, which happened 2022 up until this year. And also, we also see the rise of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, Indian, uh, in India, China, and South Africa, and their attempt on using more of local currency transaction. What do you think? Do you think BRICS can um, de-dollarize the global financial system? Or as you said before, the rumors of demise are greatly exaggerated and USD is still strong. Yeah, the rumors are greatly exaggerated. I mean, look, what you saw with the dollar strength last year is, is clarity as to why the dollar has supremacy is in times of crisis, everyone flies to the dollar. Why? Because you have a rule of law, you have a government uh, stability, you have a flourishing economy that's open to trade flows uh, in and out, you have a currency exchange rate set by the market. All the conditions that are required for a reserve currency, no other currency uh, carries those, those opportunities. So in the emerging markets, if they want to do some country-to-country uh, -country trade, in local currency, they can do that, but then they're stuck with those reserves. And then how do you recycle it through through the fixed income market? It becomes more and more complicated. So we'll see some one-offs here and there. But the fact of the matter is there's a there's an understandable uh, 
desire to de-dollarize. It's mm -hmm. just not practical. The desire is, you know, we've had zero interest rate policy since 2009 up until recently. Uh, we've had quantitative easing. We've increased our money supply dramatically in the last few years. Our debt to GDP has gone up to 120%. So I understand all of the de-dollarization arguments. The, the issue is it's just the cleanest shirt in a dirty laundry, right? What's your second best? And the answer is nothing comes close. So Leaving that aside, uh, yeah. I do think right. that with the hiking cycle in the last 12 months, we've seen a little bit of responsibility around the U.S. dollar. I think I think the world is starting to see that. We've brought down our balance sheet a little bit. Uh, and we're going to grow our way out of the 120 percent debt to GDP, just like we did after World War II right. when our debt to GDP was 120 percent. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for sharing your insights and opinion this afternoon in CNBC Indonesia. Wishing you the great success. Thank you.